our militaries. And that's your news at two minutes past seven. News talk weather. Thanks to Ryanair. Spoil ma'am this Mother's Day with a Ryanair gift card. A gift she'll love. Casually dry overnight, but with a good deal of cloud and perhaps a few patches of light rain or drizzle. Lowest temperatures of between 1 and 5 degrees with a touch of frost possible in the south where skies will be clearest early in the night. And now you're up to date on News Talk. The News Round on Off the Ball with Gillette. Start your day in flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. This is News Talk. All right, welcome along. It is Thursday, is off the ball. Nathan with you until 10 o'clock. We've got a packed show ahead. The Ireland rugby team have arrived in Rome ahead of Saturday's game against Italy. We are going to be joined by Keith Wood and Grace Davitt for the Six Nations show. That's coming up between 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock. John Giles is always with us on a Thursday at half past seven, reflecting on the week's Champions League. We'll keep a close eye on Old Trafford, Manchester United against Barcelona in the Europa League, which gets underway in an hour. And we will be paying tribute to the late, great John Motson, who sadly passed away today at the age of 77. Conor McNamara, a colleague of his at the BBC, is going to join us after 8 o'clock. And then on the football show, a really interesting interview with Brian McDermott, who was, uh, this time 10 years ago, he was the manager of the month in the Premier League. Uh, he had just won the manager of the month for uh, his role with Reading and they were obviously flying high with a strong Irish contingent. Six weeks later, as is the way of uh, modern management, he was fired. Uh, then he went to Leeds, which was, to put it mildly, an absolute basket case. Uh, but he has such an interesting story. His uh, parents were from Sligo, or from Clare. His entire dream in life was to play for the Republic of Ireland and he ended up playing for the England under-17 team and because of that he could never represent Ireland and it's uh, incredible to listen to him talk about the damage that did to him and how it still lives with him to this day that he couldn't get to play for Ireland obviously he's been linked with the Ireland manager's job as well Uh, he's had an awful lot of difficulties over the last 10 years and he's incredibly honest about that as well so that's coming up after 9 o'clock Richie McCormick is with us evening Richie Hey Nathan Uh, Arthur how are you? I, I usually turn and see Mick. Uh, Arthur O'Dea, how are you? Not so bad. Mick's off. Mick, Mick is off. It's well, great to have you. It's great to have you. So John Motson, uh, this is one of these, when the news came through today, you sort of take a step back and whoa, because he, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't uh, ill as far as I know. I hadn't heard a huge amount about him over the last couple of years. And I was quite shocked to hear that John Motson had passed away, who was such a regular figure for people of our age growing up that every time there was a big match on it was over to John Motson and he was there and he was just such a permanent part of every football fan's life uh, Richie I think it's fair to say mm. you are a uh, commentary geek uh, yeah. when it comes to these things uh, John Motson it's it's hard to sum up his impact there was the rivalry with Barry Davies. There was the rivalry with Brian Moore. Uh, in many ways, he stood alone because he did much more, it felt like, when it came to football. He was a football man first and foremost. Yeah, where Barry uh, spread himself across Olympic Games and across uh, tennis and ice skating and pretty much anything he could turn his hand to. Um, Watson was very much a football man, only did football uh, from 71 onwards uh, for the BBC of him. You know, prior to that being a a written journalist, like that, it's like the impact he has is is it's difficult to explain to younger people. And we do sound like old fogies when we go on about living in a land where there was only a handful of channels and a handful of matches available each season, never mind each week or each day. So to get a full game on was quite something. Uh, Motson always added an air of excitement to it, no matter what game it was. But also, he kind of saved the special level of excitement for a special level of game as well like if you go back and because all of this is brilliantly on youtube and thank god for that if you go back to like the euro 84 semi-final with france and portugal uh, when platini's hat trick Motson works himself up by the time platini scores the winner in extra time into an almost religious and spiritual fever Mm. like he's operating on another plane by the time that that winner goes in at the stad velodrome similarly i recall there there was a goal a brilliant goal i don't even remember this game uh, where Spain beat Yugoslavia 4-3 at Euro 2000. That, that was to get into the next round. They had to win, but ultimately the result in the other game kind of worked in their favour anyway. But uh, Alfonso, who was playing for uh, Betis, I think at the time, scored the winner. And Motson again went up into an utter stra- another stratosphere in terms of his his excitement. 
but he just had a really good way we have that we play some of these clips as we're going through them do we have that goal from so this was we do after Richie's late 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 request this was uh, Richie Richie was trying to go as hipster as he possibly could with this so uh, remind us of this game again Richie this is Yugoslavia Spain yeah, the last group game in Euro 2000, also the last day of my leaving cert, I guess, so it probably has an added bit of cachet to that as well. Uh, got home and walked into this stunner of a game where Spain needed to win. They had been trailing and came from behind to win it, and it all came down uh, to the very last minute. There were almost coaches on the side of the pitch. Guardiola played the only long ball, I think, of his career to set up this goal for Alfonso. Spanish substitutes and coaches are out, just waving everybody forward. And Ozois is there, and here's a chance for the goal, and it's in! It's Alfonso! It's, it's unbelievable! It's 4-3 to Spain! There was a big difference in terms of his style of commentary compared to Davies and Moore, who were maybe far more mellifluous in their manner, and he was more about the joy of being there, the passion, yeah. more reactive maybe to, as you say, the the goal and it's Tagana, 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 and then it's true to Platini and he just, he just loses the run of himself as the game is actually happening, whereas the other two, there was more maybe a, a storytelling <laughs> mode to it. In saying that, maybe his best piece of commentary is when he sort of did go down that route. This is... So this is the full time of the 1988 FA Cup final. It's Wimbledon uh, when they beat Liverpool in the FA Cup final. And we have his comments for after, uh, just after the final whistle was blown. You have to be more specific than that. So this is uh, John Motson talking about the crazy gang and the crazy gang. club. If we have oh, it. the tension here. He's checked with both linesmen. Oh, and there it is! The crazy gang have beaten the culture club. Wimbledon have destroyed Liverpool's dreams of the double. And all over the pitch, their players are celebrating something which a few years ago would have been impossible. Sporting gesture by the Liverpool supporters. Her Royal Highness applauds one of the great cup shocks of all time. Crazy gang beat the culture club. They finished seventh that year, Wimbledon. Seventh. <laughs> <But> that, <laughs> it's not as if they're a bunch of cloggers after coming up from the fourth that, division. Like, that was their Liverpool. name. That was their name. I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like the idea, like it, uh, even all these years later, that, that was a an insane shock um, is is still oversold. But Motson, I think, called it brilliantly. I think what he came across as more than Barry Davis and more than Brian Moore did was he came across as a fan but you can be lost if you're a commentator being a fan of football calling the game. You also have to have a special element of delivery. And he did have that. He had a really special voice. He had a voice that everybody could have an impression of. Like when you were playing football uh, with your friends or whatever growing up, Nathan, I'm sure everybody listening was the same if they're of our vintage. The commentary you went to immediately if you were faking commentary on the road, was Motson's. Mm. It wasn't Barry Davis as good as Barry Davis was. It wasn't Brian Moore. It wasn't even George Hamilton. You went straight to Motson. Motson was the the football call that you went to on the road. And there's something very, very special about that. And I think a lot of people, have, again, of a certain vintage, would be feeling a sense of loss because those voices and those presences in terms of following football, they're constant in a way that players aren't really because players can move on. But you'll also have those same people year in, year out for like nearly 50 years in his case, calling the big games and calling games involving teams that you support or perhaps don't, but just a remarkable career. Uh, the sheepskin skull, sheepskin cold. <laughs> Would you fancy one of them, Arthur? Uh, maybe at a, they, they a different came time. Back in fashion. I don't know. There I'd say it's in, sort of look to that sort of possible thing? to maintain. It's a that's a that's a very good point. To be wrecked, sheepskin like in bad weather. No, no, there's not, not a chance. His, his autobiography, I read it um, whenever it came out, it must have been, it could have been a decade ago at this stage, Yeah, uh, was interesting for <laughs> the rivalry with Davies and the impact that seemed to have on him and the jealousy he had of Brian Moore over in the ITV that he just had it all his own way. And yeah. the anxiety it caused him, the changes in director of football at the BBC and a new one would come in. And he'd be waiting patiently for every FA Cup final, for every England game, for every World Cup final, and living and dying by the decision that would be made. Now, 
that that's a big part of Davis's autobiography as well. You'd be surprised <laughs> to hear. Because when it came to football, generally Motson was the favoured one, and it was mm. devastation for Motson in '94 when Davies got the World Cup final. Yeah, yeah, and I think um, Barry got a run of of uh, FA Cup finals around about that time as well. Um, if I remember right, he, I think Barry got '95 um, with Everton and uh, and Manchester United. Um, but yeah, like that that like it, it's special though to have that kind of thing because it does in the same way if you've got two people vying for a position in any form of team, if you've got two people vying for what is essentially the one big gig at a corporation like the BBC, it's gonna bring out the best in both of them. Um and for Davies to spread himself, as I mentioned, across umpteen different sports and still be able to carry things off brilliantly, uh spoke to his talent and similarly for Motson to concentrate so fully on football and yet le- never lose that level of enthusiasm never see it dip never feel like the voice was waning never feel like he would just was watching another game and was going through the motions that was never there I don't think that was ever there you could always hear even in the latter days when he was being thrown scraps by whoever was in charge of football and sport at the BBC for match of the day he still had the enthusiasm for the game that he'd be calling, even if it was going to be a, a five minute package for Reading and Fulham. Like it was it was still there. Um and that kind of talent, that level of enthusiasm, it it's very it, well you can't fake it. And it's v- it's very, very hard to match it. Uh, your uh, favourite John Motson memory didn't make his top ten goals that he had commentated on. <laughs> uh his number one, Hereford two Newcastle United won. Uh, this was FA Cup third round replay 1972 and Ronnie Radford scored the goal for Hereford in the 85th minute. Radford. Now Tudor's gone down for Newcastle. Radford again. Oh, what a goal! What a goal! Radford the scorer. Ronnie Radford. And the crowd. The crowd are invading the pitch. Will take some time to clear the field. What a tremendous shot by Radford. He got that ball back and hit it from well outside the penalty area, and no goalkeeper in the world would have stopped that. 101 great goals. Did you watch that video? You're too young for it. No, I don't think so. Oh. It's on you. It's on YouTube. The full thing is full on YouTube. Thing. And I watched it today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Full thing. <laughs> My entire is... thought process in football is basically built around that video. And if you didn't yeah. make that, were you really a player in the 80s? <laughs> Hoddle just the answer, fashion no. all English were they all English goals well it was it was English football oh, sorry, okay. you could then get a 501 yeah. great goals that expanded yeah. to Italy and Spain and all these players you'd never heard of before but 101 great goals was the original and best oh, was it an, an, an annual yeah. thing it kept coming or that was it I, I think it was, no, was, it was, it was a one off the first v- real VHS yeah mm. it was the first re- real VHS boom and they decided that like BBC were obviously sitting on all of these amazing highlights like Radford's goal like the 88 stuff like you know Liam Brady scoring for Arsenal in spectacular fashion they had all this amazing footage and they decided to, to repackage it and like that that's a textbook for people like there's a certain type of person uh, I don't know if you can relate to this Nathan there's a certain type of person who from a pretty young enough age copped on that they weren't going to be the next John Barnes or the next Mark Hughes or the next whatever and that they figured that you. they would <laughs> probably I know they, they figured that they'd probably be better off seeking a route that could see them be the next Motson or the next Barry Davis or the next uh, the next George Hamilton or Jimmy McGee and that was like I think fairly, fairly early on I twigged that that was probably going to be better off for me uh, clearly it's worked out um, but like yeah he, was, he offered a route and he kind of uh, was, was the textbook and the benchmark in that kind of respect the bit that the younger generation we definitely do sound like old fogies I think would definitely struggle to understand is that there were only those five voices for football that was it it was McGee, Hamilton, Motson, Davies and more. And that was it. Even Martin Tyler didn't really exist <clears> in our world until 1992. So every single football match you watched from the age of four till 12, they were the only five voices you ever heard. Whereas you look at tonight, Europa League quarterfinal, you can switch on version of four different commentators and BT of four different commentators and we all sort of mash into one. Yeah, I, I guess that's just the, the trade-off for having an awful lot of football. You couldn't possibly. I mean, it's not something I appreciate. There's a romance to it and a certain nostalgia, but I'm. It's all about the romance. I'm not, I'm not sorry. That's happened either. At the same time, it's all time. about the nostalgia. Uh, what do you think his his greatest ever game was that he commentated on? Um, <clears throat> I'll give you. Oh. I'll give you the rundown. So oh, number, I, you can guess number one. So number five, Germany won yeah. England five. 
Okay. Uh, Getting better and better and better. Yeah. Liverpool 5, Nottingham Forest nil. Great which, game. Uh, we did a classic games club on during COVID. Uh, yeah. France 3, Portugal 2. Incredible match. Brazil 2, Italy 3. How is that not the top? Cup. How is that it's not the top? It's a similar vintage that finished top in his greatest ever game that he commentated on. Oh. Bo, 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 There's bo, only one bo, hint bo. you need for this. Ricky Villa. Oh, Yes. Spurs Ricky 3, Villa. Man City 2, the FA Cup Final Replay 1981. Now, that's not to say he was absolutely perfect when it came to these selections. He also, in his autobiography, picked his greatest team of overseas players from the Premier League and Division 1. And his goalkeeper, his goalkeeper, was yep. UC Yaskalainen. Oh. <laughs> that's Which is, of all <laughs> the people, of all the people I would have thought. <laughs> that's interesting. Poor old Shea Given. Yeah. Pro Peter what, Schmeichel. What, what, what is this book? Is just a, <laughs> this is just, his autobiography. Just well, this lists. is the last twenty pages. It's just, just a, lists. It's just a literally just a, a load we'll of. Get it to two forty. He's <laughs> getting it to the word count. Yeah. Uh, Five three one zero six is the text number if you want to get in touch. I say Conor McNamara is going to join us after eight o'clock as well. Uh, would have spent a lot of time working alongside John Motson, and uh, we better get into the news round, which is brought to you with Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. So you're starting with the naming of the Ireland team, Richie. Yeah, and the Ireland head coach Andy Farrell has made six changes for Saturday's Six Nations test away to Italy. Two of them are enforced, of course, with Ross Byrne and Ian Henderson in for the injured Jonathan Sexton and Ty Byrne. Craig Casey will form a halfback partnership with Byrne as Conor Murray drops to the bench. Bundiaki returns at inside centre with Stuart McCloskey among the replacements. In the pack, Leinster hooker Ronan Kelleher replaces Rob Herring and Jack Conan starts at number eight with Caelan Doris switching to the blind side and Peter O'Mahony on the bench. For Italy, fit again Paolo Garbisi returns at out half having missed their first two matches and tight head Marco Riccioni is replaced by Simone Ferrari. Farrell doesn't foresee any issues with continuity despite the volume of changes and he won't accept a dip in performance. There's obviously things that we, we need to get better at and when I when I say to you that this is our third game and our performance should be should be better than the second one. So there's there's a there's a fight and I want to, to, to get to that point. Um so again we've we've full respect for, for Italy. Um but having said that, it is about us. It's about us and our performance and making sure that we um we improve in a few areas that we want to and get something out of this game that we're that we're chasing you know because we um we obviously want to do well in this competition um but italy italy um obviously chasing that win at home and it's a big scalp isn't it you know so we we know the the emotion that they've always had but the skill that they've put in with that now makes that makes them a serious threat to us so we're aware of that and our preparation says so So Keith Wood and Grace David coming up between 8 and 9 on the Six Nations show. We'll be talking about that Irish team selection. Uh, Some potential transfer news for Ian Henderson? Yeah, Ian Henderson has been linked with a move to Toulouse after the World Cup. He turned 31 this week and the Ulster man is out of contract after the World Cup in France. A move for Henderson to Toulouse could see Springbok forward Reinhard Elstadt move in the opposite direction. Uh, Arthur hasn't been this excited since he last saw Keane Lynch in tight, tight shorts. Manchester United, Barcelona, Old Trafford. It's as good as it gets. <laughs> what a strange comment. Um, like, <laughs> yeah, it'll be great. Good match. <laughs> I don't know. You're not excited about this? Um, Europa League, you're not having it? It's fine. Like, you know, um, it'll be grand. It's a Thursday night. It'll be grand. It'll it's, be grand. Yeah, I'm more interested in looking at Sunday. Uh, okay. The League Cup final. But, yeah, this is... I, I don't even understand fully how the Europa League works. Is it a playoff round, is it? You're not quite through... Is it the last 16? It's the, the last, it's, the last 20, it's the last 24, is it? Yeah, well, th- this is the, the holding pen before you get through to the last 16. So there's a whole eight God, other teams right. that are straight through. Mm. And then whoever wins these ties tonight will join those others in the last 16. So this is a, a halfway house, if you will. Yeah, yeah, that about sums it up. That about sums up where the excitement is. Right. Uh, team news, Richie? For me, <laughs> for me, not for everyone else. I appreciate it. Uh, just the one change for Manchester United tonight. Lissandra Martinez returns to the side. Luke Shaw switches to left back and Terrell Malassia drops out. Uh, David De Gea starts in goal for them. Aaron Wambasaka, Rafael Varane, Lissandra Martinez and Luke Shaw are their back four. Casemiro and Fred are in midfield. Then it's the trio of Jaden Sancho, Bruno Fernandes and Marcus Rashford. Vout Veghorst is up top. A number of changes for Barca. Mark andre Ter Stegen starts in goal. They've got a back four of Jules Koundé, Ronald Araujo and Andreas Christensen along with Alejandro Balde. Sergio Busquets 
comes into midfield with Gavi out injured. He's partnered there by Frank Kessier and Frankie de Jong. And Rafinha and Sergi Roberto, Frank Robert Lewandowski. Up front kickoff is at 8 o'clock. Elsewhere, Roma will resume 1 0 down for their, their second leg with Salzburg at the Olympico. Shakhtar Donetsk take a 2 1 lead into their second leg away to Rennes. And Union Berlin and Ajax resume hostilities scoreless. Uh, from the first leg. Elsewhere, Sporting are heading for uh, that last 16. They're now 3 0 up away to Michelin uh, and comfortably ahead on aggregate as well. Uh, Bayer Leverkusen 3 1 up away to Monaco inside the final 10 minutes. They're now leading 5 4 over the two legs. Juventus, who uh, were slightly worried going into this one, but were helped by an early sending off for Nantes. Juve leading by two goals to nil, both of those from Angel Di Maria, and they are now ahead 3 1 on aggregate. And PSV have just taken the lead at home to Sevilla. Luke de Jong has scored that goal and will be for naught, it would seem, unless they can manage something rather spectacular in these final 30 minutes. They're now 3-1 down on aggregate. Lads, in UCG in the 80s, we always had the 101 Great Goals video playing on a portable TV while we recruited new players on Clubs Day. Simple but happy times, says Tom and Galway. Artie, get get yourself on this for the evening. If you're not excited by the Europa League, get yourself onto the YouTube of 101 great goals. You're going to see you know some I, miraculous things. Do you know what I did have? I don't know how we got it. There was like a DVD thing that was of match of the day, best of like the 60s, 70s and 80s. Okay, yeah. That was great. Was that full games or just highlights? Oh, it can't have been. No, God, no. Can't no, it was, just, it was just goal. Yeah, a certain amount of games, I think. Uh, yeah, I remember that one. That was a white box set, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, yeah. Yeah, Gary Lineker was in the front of it. You'll years. still find on... Uh, on Possibly Premier Sports sometimes at about 11 o'clock or midnight, usually of a Thursday, they'll show the big match. So ITV4, man. Uh, Saturday morning, ITV4. Oof. In between yeah. Minder. <laughs> yeah. In between Minder. Yeah, glorious. Minder's on weekdays, yeah. The odd time, Giles will pop up, running the show. The expectations of Giles every time he gets the ball, it's like, oh, see the way he just passed it five yards there. Whoo! <laughs> Tell you what. We don't have anyone who can do that now. We don't have anyone who can do that now. Yeah, it's uh, miraculous, <laughs> miraculous stuff. I don't think he features in 101 Great Goals, does he? It's sort of after his era. No. Well, no, his era, no, he's there. I, I think you, there's some yeah. leads in there. I think there is some leads in there. Um, it, but I don't it, think... It, there's an idea for a quiet period where we sit Giles down watching 101 Great Goals and he just gives a five-second comment on everybody who scores the goal. Is he involved in a West Brom one that's on 101 Great Goals? I remember Alistair Brown's name being mentioned and Giles is involved there. I'm fairly sure there is a West Brom one that Giles is involved in on 101 Great Goals. It's quite niche, this 101. It's quite I, I'm wondering, how, maybe it, it can't be that niche. Surely half the country had 101 Great Goals. You go down to your local video shop, you get the latest Survivor series, you get 101 Great Goals, happy out for the weekend. If you're that was living. Yeah, if you're 25 minutes deep into Off the Ball and you're over 35, chances are you've seen 101 Great Goals. Are you telling me you have to keep going back to the place to rent it out again and again? I think I bought that eventually in the end, nine ninety nine, big investment, but yeah. got the full value out of it. You'd rent the wrestling videos, right, right, and you'd you know sometimes you might might go all in and and buy one if you were really feeling loaded. These were tough times, Arthur. The eighties. Go and just stop. These were tough, these were tough <laughs> times. Yeah, yeah. You don't know how good you had it. Oh yeah, no, good no. you had it. Uh, Richie, run us through a few more stories. Uh, as we mentioned, their legendary football commentator, John Motson, died today at the age of 77. Having joined the corporation in 1971, he went on to cover 10 World Cups, 10 European Championships, and was the lead commentator for 29 FA Cup finals. In tributes today, he's been called the voice of football and the standard setter for his profession. Clive Tilsley explained today what set Motson apart. He was, for me, the first broadcast journalist commentator. He was as trusted by people within the game, by managers with team selection and and tactical insight as he was by the viewers themselves. And so even though some of those other great voices were maybe richer in tone and even in vocabulary, um, John's editorial now, his feel for the story, which came through in those wonderful moments, um, made him like a journalist on the air. He had the kind of gravitas of a great a football correspondent of a of a television network or a broadsheet newspaper, and uh, he could hold his own in heavy any heavyweight debate uh, about football, and that's that's what he was. He was a football man through and through. Nineteen sixty nine to nineteen eighty seven is what one hundred and one great goals encompassed. So, like, you really had to be top tier. Imagine how many great goals there were in space. Now, a lot of them mightn't be captured. In space of twenty seven years. And it must have all been captured. Well, certainly the, top, the first division ones, wouldn't they? Unless it was an ITV game, because they did split them up back then as well. 
So the, the ones that could have been on the big match wouldn't have been screened by BBC. So therefore, you'd only have your Brian Moore or Gerald Sinstat on ITV and then BBC would have Coleman or, uh, yeah, Motson or some of the others. Kev uh, Wilson home. There is golf happening at the moment? It certainly is, yeah. And uh, Shane Lowry is in the clubhouse on two under par. Two late birdies for him. Saw him end up with a round of 68 today at the Honda Classic. The joint clubhouse lead there is held by Billy Horschel and Joseph Bramlett, both of whom are on five under par. Padraig Harrington is out on course at the moment. And if you just bear with me two seconds, I'll actually get you his Live score. Live updates, not on this the is as good as it gets. Live updates from and the Honda Classic. <laughs> seven holes in, he is back to one over par. So he's dropped a shot in the last uh, couple of holes there. So Harrington, one over and six shots off the lead. Golf Weekly is available <laughs> right now. Ah, here Smooth. we go. Right that's now. all it was wasn't it yeah. that's, that's the only reason I, I wanted it um, so we are going to talk more about John Motson after 8 o'clock uh, Six Nations show as well and Brian McDermott as I say uh, well worth a listen to on the football show from 9 and we will keep you up to date with everything that happens between Manchester United and Barcelona big big game I'm buzzing for this Arthur good man here we should go out with a little bit of John Motson commentary here so 2002 Ireland Germany do you remember this I do remember this, but I, I'm almost certain I probably would have been watching an RT. I think everyone was watching it on RT, yeah, yeah. so therefore people <laughs> missed missed what was happening over on the BBC and Robbie Keane against Germany. Forward it goes again by Kinsler. Quinn heads on. Oh, surely this time for Keane. And Ireland do it. Robbie Keane in the second minute of stoppage time has scored the equaliser. Look at these scenes. Can't say they didn't deserve it. Can't listen to that without just seeing Mick McCarthy's face. Just a thing of beauty. <laughs> Celebration. Yeah. One of the all-time great moments. That was cracking. That was my vintage. That was only. All right. You're happy about that. It was ten or eleven. I'm not. There's no dourness here. I just like not. I'm not going to pretend to get excited about your over league on a Thursday night. After the last two nights we've had and the weekend that's coming. All right. Oh. Time for the cash machine. Your chance to win big. News talks cash machine. So what a month February has been on the cash machine. We've had six consecutive winners and now we're looking for number seven. It's easy to take part in the cash machine. We're about to give you an amount. You take note of it. Enter and if we call you and you give us the number, you win that cash. The cash machine 